This war was threatening to go nuclear. With MacArthur now publicly challenging Washington policy, President Truman had to make a decision, and he made a brave one. I believe that we must try to limit the war to Korea for these vital reasons, to make sure that the precious lives of our fighting men are not wasted, to see that the security of our country and the free world is not needlessly jeopardized, and to prevent a third world war. I have therefore considered it essential to relieve General MacArthur. General MacArthur is one of our greatest military commanders. But the cause of world peace is much more important than any individual. MacArthur's dismissal marked the end of an era. The end of the Allied aim to unite the two Koreas under a democratic flag. MacArthur's job went to General Matthew Ridgway, a man both liked and respected by his ground troops, and a man who accepted the idea of a divided Korea. Ridgway's aim was to establish a defensible line in the mountains and rivers just north of Seoul, from where he could keep the communists at bay. But the Chinese commander, Peng Di Wei, had an entirely different plan. Unknown to the mainly British and American soldiers who were starting to dig in, China's vast armies were preparing to launch a massive attack, their spring offensive. As night fell on the 22nd of April 1951, hundreds of thousands of North Korean and Chinese troops prepared to attack right along the battlefront, marked here in the western section of the peninsula by the Imjin River, only 30 miles from Seoul. That night, the Chinese took their positions along the banks of the Imjin and lay in wait for the order to move. The Chinese commander, Peng Di Wei's plan was for a huge coordinated attack, practically from coast to coast. And the aim of his spring offensive? To destroy entire UN divisions by swamping them with sheer weight of numbers, carving them up into small pockets and wiping them out one by one. Then he'd move to recapture Seoul. Peng ordered the North Koreans to bring pressure on the east end of the line here. But the main attack would be by the Chinese themselves punching a hole through the line in three places, against mostly South Korean forces here, American forces here, and here, in the west, where I am now, the Chinese put a large force up against the mainly British 29th Brigade, who were defending the historic invasion route to Seoul across the Imjin River. Until now, the Americans and South Korean troops had borne the brunt of this war, but over the next few days, the men of the mainly British 29th Brigade, led by Brigadier Tom Brodie, would play a vital role. The 29th Brigade's nine-mile-long front along the Imjin River was pivotal. If the Chinese breached the line in this position, the Allied divisions either side would be exposed and the routes to Seoul would be open. Of vital importance were two river crossings with tracks leading to the capital just 30 miles to the south. 700 men of the Gloucestershire Regiment guarded this track from the hills just south of a ford, which they later called Gloucester Crossing. This second crossing and track were guarded by another 700 men from a battalion of the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers. In support, both British battalions could call on the Royal Artillery's field guns back here. All this, plus some tanks in reserve here, and some other units on either side, were part of Brodie's 29th Brigade. And everything in this region was under the overall command of the American 3rd Division. There were just 4,000 men in the British 29th Brigade, thinly spaced and not yet properly dug in. 
a pitifully small contingent to be defending such a crucial stretch of front. Advancing on them, the entire Chinese 63rd Army, over 27,000 men. The British were outnumbered by around seven to one. At 10 p.m. on the 22nd of April, the first Chinese troops started to wade across this shallow section of water here. But they were held back for nearly two hours by less than 16 men from a platoon of the Gloucesters firing from up here on the south bank. And then we saw the Chinese. They were thick in the water, somewhere around 2,000 men. It was an astonishing target. And we did use up all our ammunition. After halting four separate Chinese assaults, the British troops finally ran out of ammunition, and they had no choice but to pull back and rejoin their unit. There was now nothing to stop the Chinese from advancing further. Throughout the night of the 22nd of April, vast numbers of Chinese soldiers succeeded in crossing the Imjin River, that's it down there, and pushing southwards towards here. This area, known as Castle Hill, was held by around 100 men of the Gloucester's A Company. They were in for a very long night. For six hours, under bright moonlight and under the glare of parachute flares, A Company fought a ferocious close quarters battle for control of this hill. Ah! Again and again, the Chinese attacked up it, and again and again, A Company drove them back with machine gun and mortar fire. All the time, they received vital help from their artillery just over five miles away to the rear. Shells rained down. In front of me, a whole squad was blown to pieces, and the bodies of dead and wounded scattered along the track. I did not wait to be killed. I ran beyond that barrage as fast as my legs would carry me. At times, the supporting artillery was the only thing slowing the Chinese advance. At first light on the 23rd of April, things were looking decidedly bleak for the whole 29th Brigade. In fact, it was looking grim right away along the whole Allied line. Some 30 miles over there to the east, a South Korean division collapsed under the Chinese pressure. And American and Commonwealth troops were desperately trying to plug the gap. It made it all the more vital that the British 29th Brigade held on here at all costs. The Northumberland Fusiliers guarding the easterly track down from the river, had found their forward positions threatened. The Chinese had begun to gain the high ground here, and the Fusiliers were being pushed back. The line was weakening, and the Chinese were infiltrating the gaps between the British positions. As for the Gloucesters, five miles to the west, their A Company were unable to hold out any longer on Castle Hill. There was no other option for the soldiers here reduced to just one officer and fewer than 60 men, but to pull back and join the rest of the battalion further south. Relying completely on supporting artillery fire, they managed to retreat to a hill that became known as Gloucester Hill. By dawn on the next day, the 24th of April, the entire battalion, reduced to around 400 men, were all defending Gloucester Hill against around 10,000 Chinese soldiers and they were practically surrounded. By now, the Gloucester's situation was so precarious that the 29th Brigade commander, Brigadier Brody, sent in a column of tanks along this valley in an attempt to blast its way through to them. But the lead tank was hit and it blocked the route and the attempt to break through to the Gloucester's had to be abandoned. All hope of getting help to them evaporated. At 
10 p.m., the Chinese struck. The Gloucesters fought a bloody hand-to-hand -hand battle and pushed back attack after attack. The battle raged all through the night. The entire 29th Brigade was at breaking point. If they didn't withdraw, they faced death or captivity. The attempt to get any relief to the Gloucesters may have been blocked, but over on the right, the Northumberland's line of retreat was still clear. Brigadier Brodie had ordered tanks up the track to escort them out. But the withdrawal became chaotic as the Chinese managed to swarm onto the track and climb on the British tanks. The crews of neighboring tanks were forced to hose each other's tanks at machine gun fire in a desperate attempt to dislodge the clambering Chinese. The rescue of the Northumberlands was succeeding, but only just. But the Gloucesters, off to the west, were left to their fate. In the face of the rapidly advancing Chinese, Brigadier Brodie had by now been forced to withdraw the artillery supporting his troops. And once these vital guns were silenced, the men of the Gloucesters really were at the mercy of the Chinese. The men stranded just up there on the top of Gloucester Hill were preparing for a nearly impossible task. They were going to try and make a break for it. But many had not slept or eaten for days, and with virtually no ammunition, getting back to friendly lines would be a near impossible task. The Gloucesters had started the Battle of the Imjin with 700 men. 58 had been killed in the fighting. Only 63 made it back to the safety of British lines that night. Nearly 600 Gloucesters were taken prisoner. It was a very shameful moment surrendering. I hated doing it. Surrendering seemed to go against everything that I thought soldiering should be about. The rest of 29 Brigade had fared little better than the Gloucesters, but those few days in April 1951 had taken their toll on the enemy too. Although 29 Brigade had lost a quarter of its men, it had destroyed nearly half of the Communist forces attacking them across the Imjin. And right the way along the entire battlefront in Korea, other British, American and Allied forces fought heroic battles of their own. No one knows exactly how many the Chinese lost, but it was in the tens of thousands. The communist offensive ground to a halt along the entire battle line. Like the Americans, they too had finally realized that neither of them could win control of the whole of Korea. While the Allied crushing of the Communist Spring Offensive, in great part along the Imjin River, did not end the fighting immediately, it did bring both sides to the negotiating table. Yet when they first met on July the 10th, 1951, few could have had any inkling that the negotiations would drag on for over two years. All this time, the vicious battles for minor stretches of tactical ground continued, and the casualty rate soared. This increasingly futile war was to go on another two years before the fighting finally ended. The two sides agreed the position of the new border between them, and they agreed on roughly the line of the 38th parallel just about here. And on the 27th of July, 1953, they agreed a ceasefire. In three years of warfare, more than two million people had lost their lives, and a country had been devastated. And there's one even bigger irony. The two sides have never signed a peace treaty. The state of war between North and South Korea still officially exists. To this day, 
Korea's two sides remain in an uneasy stalemate. North Korea is still one of the most undeveloped countries in the world and fiercely secretive. South of the border, it's a very different story. South Korea has developed into a vibrant and thriving democracy. Today, the two Koreas may be vastly different, but one thing hasn't changed. For the people of North and South Korea, the threat of a return to hostilities still looms. 50 years after the ceasefire, South Koreans still plan for the worst. Around twice a year, a siren sounds across the South Korean capital here in Seoul. It's a drill for the taking of immediate shelter in the event of a North Korean attack. For a few minutes, these city streets empty in readiness for a return to hostilities.